Okay, so this is going to be lecture 20 in our series going through the book of Acts. And where we left off in Acts 7, right near the end of Acts 7, this is the crescendo now. Stephen is uh, just coming to the end of his magnificent speech to these people, to these religious leaders who are contradicting him and coming against him. And um, after giving them a recap of their redemptive history as a nation and pointing out to them that in their history, God's people, his prophets, have been continually misunderstood. They've been continually harassed, persecuted. Some of them have even put to death. And then uh, Stephen uh, targeted these people specifically, personally. He called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. People who always resist the Holy Spirit. This is 751. As your fathers did, so do you. And um, he asked the question, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers, who received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. That's Stephen's powerful speech there. He said, this is, this is nothing new. This has been going on since the beginning. Uh, Israel has been a nation filled with hard-hearted, stiff-necked people who resist the plans and purposes and people of God. And he says, and you're doing it, just like your fathers before you. And um, look at the response here. This is pretty powerful. Verse 54. And we'll read to the end of the chapter. 54. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What, what a powerful exchange. Look at their response. Look at his response. This really grabs our attention here. Powerful and instructive. This is what you can expect from fallen human nature. When it's exposed to what it really, really is and open to examination, uh, this is what you get. Rage, outrage, anger. Um, it becomes insanity, violent insanity. Normally, naturally, in, especially in this part of the world, in the present state of things, this wicked, fallen, depraved human nature is normally kept um, subdued. We have a government system that will punish evildoers. We have law enforcement. We have laws. We have jails, courts, and judges. So most of the time, people keep their sinful nature and their selfish desires hidden a little bit. But you lift that off them. You take away the restraints and watch it happen. And I, I saw this happen, and you did too, a few years ago when Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, that's, uh, what was the place it hit? Louisiana. 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 Yeah, yeah. That's what New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. That, that's it. When that uh, tsunami, hurricane, whatever it was, hit that part of the world, law local law enforcement was uh, powerless. And this natural disaster had affected everybody. And they were shipping people over to Texas for care and aid and for provision, right? But with all this chaos, watch the lawlessness. And people were getting looted, brutalized. Women were getting raped. It was a horrible nightmare scene. And in Texas, they had to set up what they were calling frontier justice. If we see anything like that going on, they were shooting them on sight. And they were making makeshift jails to cage these animals. You see, one natural disaster that affected law enforcement 
and their ability to keep order and people turn into a bunch of degenerates, a bunch of animals. And this is what happens. This is what's really in the heart of fallen man. We think we're, we dress nice, we talk nice, we make promises, <laughs> but really what's underneath when it's allowed to come to the surface is, is horrible. It's nightmarish. Normally hidden, but there it is. And I want to say that the laws and the government system that's in place, all of this is here and we, we are enjoying it and its benefits because all of it was built upon a Christian foundation. Societally, we benefit today in this good land because Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. That's how our Charter of Rights and Freedoms begins. You don't want to live in a country that wasn't founded on Christian principles. I don't want to live in those countries either. I like how it's disappearing. But it's eroding. And what we're enjoying now is just residual because they're trying to chop out the Christian foundation from out, out from under us. And uh, the blessings will only continue for so long and then we're going to start seeing uh, the horrible uh, outcome of doing this, right? But um, I want to say this. Rational dialogue is impossible with depraved people like this. Uh, Stephen gave them a history of this nation's interaction with God. It's biblical. It's demonstrative. He has told them the truth. We are told that in head-to-head -head rational combat, they could not refute this man. And how did they respond to him? Did they repent? Did they engage in anything that looked like a respectful intellectual encounter? No. They stopped their ears. We, were, we just read it. They stopped their ears and rushed at him. You cannot have rational dialogue with people who are this depraved. They are irrational. They are completely without understanding. Their hearts and minds have been darkened. They are like brute beasts. They are driven by emotion and base desires. This is all biblical language. Jude will talk like this. Second Peter will talk like this. Paul will talk like this in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. When the restraints are lifted, their motives are exposed, and so is their madness. And this is what's happened. They stopped their ears. They made a noise. They don't want to hear. They're not going to listen. In fact, I think they're so reprobate, most of these people, they're unable to listen. And they rushed at Stephen, and they just wanted to kill him. And they did. But look at the contrast between these two, between Stephen and this group that murdered him. There's an amazing contrast. They resisted the Holy Spirit, but Stephen, we're told, was full of the Holy Spirit. So the... This, the Spirit's ministry in their lives, they just resisted him and drew back. But Stephen was a Spirit-filled man. That means the Holy Spirit had a control of Stephen. Stephen was in submission to God and God's Spirit. Um, these people were spiritually dull, but Stephen had amazing spiritual insights. He was a gifted witness, and he gave witness to those people. Uh, they desired Stephen's destruction. Isn't, I mean, that's pretty clear, isn't it? They rushed at him, made a noise, stopped their ears, picked up stones. They wanted him destroyed, but he desired their salvation. Isn't that amazing? He wanted them to be preserved. He wanted them to find salvation in Jesus. He wanted them to find forgiveness. He actually prayed for them. We read that. He cried out with a loud voice, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge, he says. Isn't that amazing? Well, that points to Jesus. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> you say, I think this man has been in touch with Jesus. He kind of sounds like him. Yeah. Isn't that what Jesus did? Yeah. Well, they nailed him to a tree. Yeah. He said what? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Not only does he ask the Father to forgive them, but he actually stands and makes intercession. Mm -hmm. They don't know, Father. Forgive them. He has a case he's making. What an advocate. And, um, and uh, Stephen has the same spirit. He's, he's operating in the same way. That's hard. Could I do that? Could you do that? <laughs> you get cut off. You're driving home. Someone cuts you off. <laughs> you know? We're so we're impatient, sometimes petty, 
sometimes uh, unforgiving, hold a grudge, whatever, and yet these things ought not to be so. Not, not in the life of the believer. I was thinking of Paul in Ephesus. Paul in Ephesus? Yeah. Where the crowd just worked, got to riot. Right. State. Right. Yeah, that's Acts 19. We're going to get there yet. Yeah. Two hours they were chanting. Great Diana of the Ephesians, right? Yeah. They don't even know what they're talking. It says some people were crying one thing, others were crying another, and, and didn't some know. didn't even know what the world they were doing there. <laughs> By the way, I did experience this firsthand. Do you remember a few years ago, we had this outcry against Stephen Harper? Do you remember this? And uh, a bunch of, I would say, modern-day hippies, they got together to have big rallies and to camp out. They set up tents downtown, and they, and they called it Occupy. And we're, they're going to protest Stephen Harper, our former prime minister. And when I was in Regina, they had one of these big rallies. And there was a guy with a microphone and a big amp, and he's going on about Stephen Harper. And all these young people were all gathered around, an ocean of them. And I asked them, asked them one at a time, I would ask these, these young people, hey, what in the world are we doing here? What are we protesting? What, what did Stephen Harper do that we're angry about? Yeah, what did he do? Not one of them could answer me. <laughs> Not one of them could actually tell me anything. They said, I have to go talk to that man over there. He, has the answer. he doesn't have the answers. No one does. No one knows why. Are we, why are we so angry? No, nobody knew. He's the only one with the brain. It goes on to this very hour. Yeah, I ran into a problem when, when uh, the voting time came up and where I was living, and uh, the person that was uh, speaking about uh, uh, us uh, voting for uh, Trudeau, and I got up and I spoke against it. Well. <clears throat> Some of the people that were there would not be friends, were kind of nasty for the rest of the time yeah, that I lived yeah. there because I spoke against Trudeau sure. at that yeah. time. Well, we're told here in our text that uh, there's a man present, and he's called a young man named Saul. That tells us that he's under 40 years old at this time. In Bible times, if you're under 40, you're a young man. So Dan is still a young man over there. For a short time. He's <laughs> 40. Oh, yeah, you hit that mark. Yeah. Oh, right. It's all downhill now. Okay. We don't well, have... how young do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> There's no young people here except for Marcus. <laughs> okay. Right. I forgot, Dan, you hit that milestone. And uh, we do find out from uh, Philippians, the third chapter, that, and other places, that Paul was a... Saul, Paul, same guy. He was a Pharisee. He was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, a very famous rabbi. We've heard from him already in Acts 5. And um, he was there giving approval to all this. And uh, we know that in the future, very sh in a very you know, short time, just two chapters, this man Saul is going to be converted. He's going to become a powerful instrument in the hand of God. In fact, he will become the most brilliant, insightful, fearless, productive missionary in church history. And um, I, I say that just to say this now, this event right here and, and his involvement in it would continue to haunt this man for his entire life. This, this haunted him. And, and his teacher would never have anticipated this. No way. No way Gamaliel would have thought. <laughs> Saul, you were my chief student. What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? But, but Paul will tell us in... Um, in 1 Timothy, he, he will say, this is, a, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul never got over it. And it will come up from time to time. He never got over his involvement in this. And yet he does know in his heart of hearts that he's forgiven. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see something amazing in the scriptures. If I could just sort of telescope, jump a few chapters isn't he one place at least where he specifically mentions the stoning of Stephen in his Acts? He, he, I think that's true. I need to locate that. I think there is one definitely one, in the book of there Acts. There are several places where he talks about persecuting the church. Yes. But I think there's one in which he specifically mentions the stoning yeah. of Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. We'll find that reference yet. But um, <laughs> you talk about forgiveness and tenderheartedness and understanding. 
reconciliation. This is, this is Stephen, one of the seven that were chosen to uh, be ministers in the church. Who else is numbered there? A man named Philip. Philip also. Yeah. And when Paul heads back to Jerusalem for the last time in the book of Acts, you know where he's going to stay? In Philip's house. And Philip didn't say to him, get out of here, you murderer. I don't want you here. I don't trust you. No. He invites him in. Brother Paul, come stay with me, right? That's amazing. That's supernatural. That's a, that is a spiritual change in people's hearts and minds that I don't think human strength alone can quite muster that, you know? This was Philip's friend that just got murdered here and Saul was giving his thumbs up to this. And yet later on, they're going to be okay with each other and more than okay with each other. Isn't that incredible? Just incredible. It looks okay. like it when Ananias was... Yeah. It's kind of comical in a way. That yeah. That's the form of God about yeah. how bad Paul is. It was. Yeah. All right, let's jump now to chapter 8. We'll begin with chapter 8. And... Um, We'll see how far we get here. Let's read the first four verses. It says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Uh, we're told here that, especially under Saul, an enormous persecution erupted in Jerusalem. Uh, many of the believers fled. They went all over the place. There's Judea down there. It said some went to Judea. Um, but people basically fled and went throughout the Holy Land communicating the gospel and, um, but not the apostles. The apostles stayed put in Jerusalem. And no Bible commentary that I've ever read, and I've read a lot on this, really understands why that is. The apostles are called the sent ones. Why didn't they go anywhere? <laughs> why did they stay in Jerusalem? We must believe that they were obeying God and, and that they stayed put because he wanted them to. I'm just going to offer this. Remember in Acts 1.8, uh, Jesus told his apostles... You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, in Acts 8.1, just reverse the numbers now. In Acts 8.1, we have the apostles still here in Jerusalem, but others are heading for Judea and Samaria. So you have a simultaneous witness to Jesus happening in all the places designated by the Lord in Acts 1.8. So I just think that's kind of neat there. Jerusalem was not completely evacuated of Christians. The apostles stayed right there, but others would carry the message. Now you're going to see in the early years of the church, the apostles would have to come endorse the message that was being spread. We're going to see that in Samaria. Others went there and evangelized, and a great work was being accomplished, but men, apostles from Jerusalem would have to go there and make sure that uh, the work was being carried out properly and that people saw that the apostles of Jesus Christ himself, were in, they were endorsing what was happening here. This, because they're the link to the actual Jesus. You can have an evangelist there witnessing, and that's great, but how do we know he's tied to Jesus himself? It would be via the apostles, the apostolic witness. The apostles were there and laying hands on people and uh, making that connection there, okay? Now, um, let's read the next couple of verses here, verses 5 to 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out, and many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Um, remember, Samaria at this time, we have a mixed multitude kind of here. We have people here who are considered, if we could use a vulgar term, half-breeds, right? 
You remember back in Old Testament times, in 722 BC, you had the kingdom of Judah down here and the kingdom of Israel up here. And because Israel did not have one righteous king, Judah had eight righteous kings out of how many? I don't, I don't remember, but at least they had eight. These guys didn't have one. So in 722 BC, as God predicted, the Assyrians came into the region, took the people captive over to Assyria. Now they trickled back uh, under the direction of the Assyrians. They came back to the region, but there was all kinds of intermarriage happening. And so what happened by the time we get to the times of Jesus, the, the Jews living here in Jerusalem and Judea, they consider themselves to be more pure Jews. We're the real Jews. We're the real Hebrews. We're the real descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You guys up here, you're a bunch of half-breeds, and they had no dealings with each other, and they actually looked with disdain on each other. So the Jews down here are saying, you must worship at the temple. And these guys are saying, no, no, Mount Gerizim is where you worship. And there's a conflict. Religiously, there's a conflict. Socially, there's a conflict. But you remember that Jesus went to that region, didn't he? In John 4. And not only was he conversing and talking theology with a Samaritan, it was a Samaritan woman. And it was a woman who was heavy laden with sin too. But Jesus had time for her. In fact, his apostles came back. They had gone to get food. They came back and saw him sitting at that well talking with the woman and it says they saw, this, they saw what was happening and they marveled that he spoke with a woman. He said, Jesus, in his economy, he says, you can talk theology with a woman. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Some shocking thing here. You know? He never revealed something to him. He never said to anyone else. Mm -hmm. yes, he he declared himself. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. that's correct. Yeah. Very important point there, Peter. Yeah. I think... As I analyze the New Testament, I think there's only three, maybe four places in all four Gospels, in the Gospels, you take you know, all four of them, you can find maybe three or four places where Jesus comes right out and says, I'm the Christ. Yeah. He doesn't do it often. But one of the times he does it is with that woman there, that Samaritan woman at the well. And I'll just offer this to you. If the Gospels are fiction, if they were written hundreds of years after Jesus, we know they weren't, but if they were, they were written by people who were trying to promote the idea that Jesus is the Christ, don't you think they would have him claiming to be Christ on every page? I mean, every other page, you turn it, oh, there he is claiming to be Christ again. I guess he's the Christ. No, he, he, he very rarely comes out with it. And that's just another little sign of authenticity in the Gospels. It's another little sign there. That is something that a forger wouldn't do. You see, somebody with an agenda wouldn't do that. So I just thought I'd offer that to you. Uh, we're told that um, Philip went there and he preached Christ. That's the job. That's the job of the church. I love that. He preached Christ to them. Uh, I'm not going to want to rant about this, but of all the things the church could be talking about, let's talk about Christ. Let's not cease to teach and preach Jesus. Whatever else we want to talk about, let's not forget to teach and preach him. Now, his witness here was accompanied by sign miracles, we're told. Philip was evangelizing, and he was performing sign miracles, exorcisms, and healings. And um, the result was great joy in that city. And I want to say that that's always been a diagnostic feature of the redeemed and the born again. You can have a bad day. You can be going through very difficult things that make you sad. We all do, but there has to be something called joy in there somewhere. There has to be deep down in your heart of hearts, there's got to be the knowledge that things are going to be okay. You know, in the future, it's all going to be okay for those who love and trust Jesus. And you've got that assurance that you're among that number. That's called joy. So you can be sad and still be joyful, right? I think happy is different than joyful. We understand that? Happy is related to the word happenstance. It's all based on circumstance. What's going on in your life right now? Are you happy? You, oh, I got a free roll up the rim. I'm happy now. 
oh, someone took my parking spot. Now I'm, now I'm having a bad day. Now it's a horrible day. <laughs> I have no joy left. <laughs> it shouldn't be like that. The Christian doesn't need to be up and down like that. We go through hard things. I know that. Um, and I'm talking to myself too. I'm not perfect in this area for sure. But since I got converted, I've always had it in my heart deep down. I know it's going to be okay. In fact, it's going to be better than okay. It's going to be fantastic for those who love and trust Jesus. And that is a diagnostic feature, I think, of the redeemed and the born again. We try, through God's help and enablement, to see all things through the eyes of faith, to put all things in proper perspective, and to interpret things correctly. And we use God's word to help us with that, right? We know that the things we lay our eyes on are transitory, Right? I'm looking at a sick body here. I look at a bad back. I look at whatever. You, the things you can see with your eyes, Paul says, transitory, temporal. <laughs> Paul says, look at the things that are eternal. And I think of God. Think of love, the redeemed, heaven, <laughs> you know, our future, eternal things. Okay, well, let's look what happened here. Just a couple minutes left. Verses 9 to 13. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also, would, also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. So amid all this great success in evangelism in Samaria and the joy that sort of saturated the region at that time, there stands one guy now, and his name is Simon. In Latin, he is called Simon Magus. Simon the magician, the sorcerer. And we, are, we read here that to one extent or other, he captured the people's imagination as a wonder worker, um, and they're admiring this man. He has great influence over the people. The people believed him, and he used that influence to manipulate people. You're going to see that. He, that'll be next week, or I guess week after, because we have our special lecture coming up next week. But he would manipulate people. He would use his power to get what he wanted done. This man, Simon Magus, he is manipulating the people. That's that much we know for sure. Uh, we want to say that power corrupts. Absolute power cor uh, corrupts absolutely. And we do see that here with Simon. In fact, the early church had a lot to say about Simon. He is, he is the wellspring from which every cult, every aberrant faith system uh, has come which I think is probably overstating the case a little bit. But um, he, is, he is not a believer. Can I just put it that way? Simon Magus is not a believer. Uh, he is a wonder worker, though, and um, he's going to manipulate people for selfish desires. It says here, I'll just leave it with this. He says, it says here that he believed Philip and he was baptized. He believed Philip and was baptized. Be very careful with this. Believing does not mean you're saved, right? And this is, the, this is the point I'm going to close with. Just believing does not make you saved. And I caught this a long time ago as I read John's Gospel, the eighth chapter. In John chapter eight, there's a, a very subtle but extremely important distinction that's made there between people who believe Jesus and people who believe in Jesus. In the Greek, it's there. And it's there in English too. In, in John 8, 31, it says, Jesus spoke to Jews who believed him. We got Jews who believe him. They are still lost. Okay? John 8, 30 says there were many who believed in him. In two verses, you get a distinction. People who believe in him, saved. People who simply believe him, lost. Simon Magus believed that Philip had supernatural sanction and power. He believed that. But he probably never believed in Christ personally for salvation. That's the difference there, okay? 
Does that make sense to everybody here? You can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You can even believe he died on a cross and rose again. That does not mean you're saved. You need to believe in him, trust in him, appropriate the saving benefits of what he did by exercising saving faith in him. Major, major difference. Simon, Simon Magus here is our little object lesson. He knows that, that um, Philip is in contact with the supernatural. He knows that Philip has been sanctioned by some deity or other to spread a message, and he has great power at his disposal. Simon believes all that. But as we traffic through Acts 8, you're going to see that this man probably never really received Jesus by faith. He probably never put his faith in Jesus. And, I, and as I say, go back and look at your Bible. Act, um, John 8, 30 and 31. You'll see it there in English and in Greek. Jews who believe him, Jews who believe in him. And in fact, if you keep reading, he has, a, has something to say to those who simply believe him. And at the end of his speech to them, it becomes very clear they're not saved yet. Not yet. Okay, does that make sense? Make sense to everybody? So I'm going to close that off there. That's, um, that's a pretty powerful thing to end our lecture with. And um, hopefully people will do the right thing with that information and that encouragement. So how about a word of prayer? And we'll, cl and we'll just close off our lecture here. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for this special time we can be together to open your, your sacred library, the Bible. We're so grateful, Lord, for the truth that's here. Uh, teach us, God. Encourage our hearts. Help us to exemplify in our lives all the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, Lord, help us to be good ambassadors for Jesus. Help us to love him more and more each day and to speak the truth in love and boldness. May we be fruitful, God, in your kingdom in every good word and work. Thank you, God, for the work you've uh, ordained that we should walk in. May we be fruitful now. As we go from this place, bless and protect your people, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God.